folks, Michael Mann from Michael Mann Security Services. Welcome to Security Guard to Bodyguard. Uh, if you're a security officer, you're looking to enter the executive protection uh, field, then this short presentation is going to give you some ideas on how to do that. Uh, very specifically, we are going to talk about the five myths of executive protection, and then I'm going to get into training requirements. All right. All right, so let's uh, get into it. All right, myth number one, you need law enforcement or military experience to get into executive protection or to be a good executive protection agent, and that is a myth that is false. Believe it or not, most military and law enforcement folks uh, do not do protective work uh, in their uh, chosen field. In the military, that is a very specialized military occupational specialty, or MOS. And uh, in law enforcement, uh, again, the majority of those folks do not do this either unless they're assigned to some sort of like governor's or mayor's detail. And that's a very, very small portion of the law enforcement um, realm or uh, folks in that career path. Okay. So these are two very specialized jobs. And the majority of people that serve, whether they're in the military or law enforcement, never, never do that type of work. So, uh, because of that, the majority of law enforcement, military, or military veterans do not have any EP training or any EP experience. So they gain that experience after they come into the field or as they're trying to get into the field. So you don't have to have this training or this sort of experience to get in. Um, some good things about having a background in law enforcement, military, uh, in, in law enforcement, depending on what, what branch of service and what your MOS was in the military. You, they, those folks do have some specialized weapons training, uh, very specific law enforcement. They probably have military. They've dealt with stressful situations in the past. So those are things that can help. But in general, I want everybody to understand that you do not have to have this experience to actually get into the field. All right. Uh, we can train just about anybody to be a protector. All right. Myth number two, the bigger you are, the better. And that is not true. If you look at these, these are two bodyguards right really you know we're here, we're here what we're talking about is executive protection specialists and there's a distance really between that and the bodyguard but here uh the bodyguard or, or these folks are big guys this is this is a perception of protection so perception versus protection there's a difference this is a perception that this guy's being protected i'm not saying he's not i'm not sure i would want to try to jump on this fellow with these two guys around him uh but protection really isn't about size it's not about physical strength it's about the planning and preparation that goes into prevention, okay? Protection is about prevention, and that requires detailed planning, and that doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, have to live in the gym or weigh 400 pounds to actually be a, a, an effective protector. So bigger is not better. That is not true. Some of the most effective uh, protection professionals in the industry uh, around the world are my size, you know, 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11. 173 pounds okay they just know how to plan and they know how to do things ahead of time uh to put those preventative measures in place so bigger uh the bigger the better is a myth myth number three certification executive protection you need to get that or this school will give you a certification executive protection that is not true in the united states there is not a certification in executive protection if you go to uh, the majority of executive protection schools, you will be issued a certificate of completion, okay? Not a certification. Uh, in the United States, all states or, or uh, local governments, depending on where, you, where you're at, the state regulates it, but the local government, like the city or county, may have some more in-depth requirements. But in general, the state sets the requirements for executive protection work. And, you know, in most states, that's going to be a guard card. That's going to be your unarmed or armed guard card, depending on the scope of the executive protection job. So when you hear schools say, we're going to certify you in executive protection, that's not really true. What will happen is if you meet the objectives of that, of that class, you pass the written exam, physical requirements, whatever the requirements are, you get a certificate of completion. Okay, that's a private school. Remember, uh, the states and sometimes the local governments uh, regulate uh, all protective services or executive protection operations. And again, most of the time, that's some sort of a guard card, okay? Which if you're a security officer watching this today, you already have that. Myth number four, training. At one size fits all. And what I mean by this is uh, there are schools out there that will say, hey, come to our school, you're going to pick up everything. 
That is just not true. Executive protection is a very specialized skill. It's going to take a number of training uh, schools or classes uh, to um, get everything that you need. And actually, you'll never have everything that you need. Um, so one school is not going to provide this. Uh, I may go to a month-long school somewhere and they teach uh, a lot about the physical protection, a lot about advances, operational planning, etc. But uh, they may not spend a lot of time on driving That's because I have to go to a specialized school for that. And so, again, there's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to training. You're going to have to find the school that works best for you and attend those schools, all right? So it's going to be, you know, this is a, in this, in this field, uh, protection or the protection professional uh, needs to understand that this is a continuous training process, and that means you're going to have to attend multiple schools to get the majority of information that you need. One is not going to do it, all right? Myth number five, you must be armed to protect the client. Uh, that is not true. The gun is a tool of response, not protection. Guns do not protect people. Our planning does. Effective protection requires detailed planning. Okay? Effective protection requires detailed planning. Again, the gun is a tool. Um, and uh, you know, if we go to guns for whatever reason, there's something on our planning uh, that uh, you know that was either ineffective or it didn't go right. And so. Um, you do not have to be armed to necessarily protect a client. You have to be armed maybe to respond to an armed threat, but you don't have to be armed to protect. Believe it or not, the majority of executive protection details, the large ones, especially those that protect high net worth clients, are unarmed details. They are not armed here in the United States. All right, let's talk about some training requirements. Again, all this is very quick, so you can watch this within about 10 to 12 minutes, and then you can go on your merry way and, and uh, figure out what you want to do to become a uh, protective agent or protection professional. So training requirements, uh, you know, number one is what I call the foundation of protection. Okay, The foundation of protection is uh, I need uh, specific training on operational planning. Okay, Again, effective protection or physical security desire, or desire, or I'm sorry, requires planning. And so because of that, you need to learn how to do at least a basic operational plan uh, when you go to your training or school. That second foundation is conducting advances. Advances are those security procedures that we conduct prior to the principal or protectee's arrival at a specific location. So advances and planning are key to not only prevention, but getting the principal uh, in and out not only safely, uh, but in a way that pleases the client it makes things easier for him or her. And then arrivals and departures. Arrivals, arrivals and departures historically have been uh, uh, locations that uh, provide or create the highest risk for the protectee or the principal. And so because of that, we need to practice those arrivals and departures. So uh, these three elements are really four when we, we, if we broke down arrivals and departures are the foundation of protection training. Right? This is not everything you need, but you need to learn quite a bit about this, and this should be in a basic school. The second training requirement should be behavioral threat detection. We get in here like a snapshot threat assessment. So as you get out with a principal, you already understand what your pattern analysis at that location should be or what it looks like. And then uh, as you're looking and as you're watching the crowd or you're watching those folks that are actually there to see your principal, you're looking for things that don't belong and you're going to make a snapshot threat assessment or snapshot threat assessments to keep the principal safe. Early detection of adversary activity is the key to success. So behavioral threat detection is a key skill that is required. Okay? Um, tough thing about this is there's not a lot of folks that teach a really effective behavioral threat detection, and those that do uh, charge a lot of money, so it's very expensive. Okay? But it is something that you need to be an effective protector. Third uh, training requirement would be medical response for protection agents. Now, I don't, I don't need to be a special forces medic in a big pack to be able to respond to a medical event for the principal. The majority of people in the United States die from heart disease. So almost 700,000 people a year die from heart disease. It's the number one killer in the U.S. according to the CDC. So because of that, there's some things I need to know. And it just doesn't have to be cardiac related or heart disease related, but there's some other things you need to learn. And the first thing is when we talk about just basic medical response for protection agents, is how to do that medical assessment survey 
in that personal security vulnerability assessment for the client, number one. So we need to know what that looks like and how to do that. Number two, we need to know about uh, CPR. We need to know how to do CPR, like conduct those operations, right, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, we need to know how to use an AED, especially we have in the car, or obviously as we go to locations with the principal in our advance, we're going to identify where those AEDs are. And of course, so we need to know how to use one. Uh, you know, again, it'd be nice if we have an AED with us at all times, all right? But they're expensive, and so that may be something you may or may not have in your protective kit, okay? And then, of course, it's always good to know uh, some basic and advanced first aid and, of course, uh, some, uh, some skills uh, dealing with trauma. Okay. So all of this can be learned, uh, you know, in a couple of days. It's not the, again, it's not everything that you need to know about medical response, but it's the basics that you need to know to go out and be a, an effective protect, uh, protection agent, especially if you're in the beginning of your career. And then, of course, if you're going to be armed, if you're going to be in an armed detail, you plan to do arm work, firearm strength and certification is going to be a must. There are state and local requirements to carry firearms anywhere that you're doing security operations. So you're going to have to meet those requirements, number one. Number two, your training should cover both mindset marks or all should cover mindset marksmanship and manipulation. Okay, so uh, it should cover those three M's or that combat triad. You need to learn about your support equipment in that training. Also, what works and what does not. This is a big thing for schools. Uh, anytime I put on a class, you're going to have if there are twenty people in a class, six people are going to figure out that their stuff doesn't work very well, not because they. Um, didn't know what they were doing, but they thought it worked. And as we went into the training environment and we started doing exercises and drills, they figured out that it's not the best equipment. So there's always a percentage in a class that I teach uh, of folks where they'll figure out that their stuff doesn't work. Okay. We also need to learn about covert carry. There's a difference between covert carry and concealed carry. Covert means, you know, that it is not apparent that you're carrying and that's always good and protective work. Uh, and then a lot of people carry, you know, so they can be covert. A lot of people will carry micro or smaller pistols. So uh, if that's the case, you need to practice that pistol. And there's some, uh, you know, there's uh, some training added to classes if you're using smaller handguns or micro pistols. All right. So that's the basic security guard to bodyguard, some things that are required. So we talked about the myths and some training requirements. If you have any questions, you can always uh, contact us at contact at michaelmansecurityservices.com. We'll give us a call 615-956-3912. Or you can always go to michaelmansecurityservices.com uh, and send us a message. All right. All right. Uh, tune in uh, next time where we will uh, continue with executive protection operations. And we're actually going to get into behavioral threat detection for the protection professional. All right, see you next time.